Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to episode 207 of Anesthesia and Pain Management Success. I'm here with our special guest, Dr. Krishnan Chakravarthy. Uh, Dr. Chakravarthy and I were just in Miami together at the Aspen Conference, had a lot of fun, and excited to today circle back on some of the things that we've discussed in the past about medtech startups, his current clinical and research initiatives, and uh, some other exciting things going on in his life. So, Dr. Chakravarthy, welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Justin. A real pleasure. Uh, always enjoy our conversations. Um, really glad to be back, actually. Uh, so when we previously spoke, uh, we were talking about mm-hmm. startups was one of the things, and you were a guy with a lot of different things going on clinically, business-wise, yeah. and we talked about like the idea of ancillary opportunity, the, the businesses related to the clinical practice of medicine. Why don't you tell us about mm-hmm. what the the startup yeah, landscape looks like for you right now as far as things you're involved in? Well, you know, it, it's going well, but you're probably looking at my growing beard that's got more white hair, which probably means that it's a, a ton of work. So, you know, I look, I, I think no startup is for the faint of the heart. Um, we've done a pretty amazing job. Um, I'm going to probably talk about two of my big initiatives right now, which I think is very relevant um, to the current practice. So, uh, one of the businesses that I launched in 2019 called um, Nextim, which is uh, Next Generation Stimulation Technologies, we had this, um, you know, I, I still continue to have a very important vision for what I think the med tech space and the pain industry needs to focus on. So I'll, I'll give you a good, I'll give you some really startling statistics. And I, and I think it just continues to reinforce the, the importance of understanding the problems that you focus on when you're thinking about building any core technology for the market. And we started with this vision that at the end of the day, when you look at about 50.2 million Americans, and then you extrapolate that out to the rest of the world, there is a huge shortage and disparity in access to cutting edge technologies that are prohibitive because of cost and access. Um, I go back and, you know, we were just at the recent INS meeting in Mumbai, and it was amazing. You had a lot of these big vendors there, but, you know, when you talk to the physicians there, they will tell you that it is really, really challenging to adopt any of this because there's no insurance companies over there. There is nobody willing to pay $100,000 to the cost of the health system, the device companies, the manufacturers to even see that process through. So in 2019, when we had started this journey, we had this um, vision of creating low cost devices as an entry point into the market and creating one type of um, almost a cohesive ecosystem across patients and physicians. And we've had some very good success from it. In fact, we got our first device FDA approved and into the market. Um, we've about a thousand plus patients treated since um, since we launched about six to seven months ago. Um, we're continuing to challenge ourselves in all of the things that come with commercial scalability of an organization versus something where you're building proof of concept. Um, but we've crossed about five million minutes of treatment usage on our ecosystem. And what we found is um, we've taken the approach of a really low cost solution as a field EMS transcutaneous unit that's uh, interdigitated with big data and AI. Um, But what's fascinating about the data that's coming out of this is I'm recognizing majority of the times when we're actually talking to patients, there's very little time that's spent in really understanding holistically how much of their chronic pain issues we can't really solve in a short visit. So this idea of digital interconnectedness between the the patient and the physician and this kind of holistic ecosystem development, I think is very much in line with the future. I think we are, as medical practices get more and more busy, um, we've really integrated a low cost device with um, a lot of the remote patient monitoring uh, modalities and codes that are currently being built and used uh, nationally. 
Can you help me understand the patient experience with this device kind of from beginning to end and how the, I learned a new word from you, the interdigitation functions in yeah. terms of educational process? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, look, I, I, I think, so just to give a backdrop, you know, when people are talking about remote patient monitoring, it was very well established in the cardiac and diabetes space. Today, we are seeing a lot of these different businesses try and incorporate some of this stuff into the interventional pain space. The challenge is a lot of the devices that are out there, like weight machines, blood pressure cuffs, all of these things that were effective for preventative medicine. In fact, there was a recent article that, you know, cardiac surgery showed a 0%, almost complete uh, 0% mortality rates after using earlier remote patient or digital interventions in terms of accessing patients. So where that is meaningful is imagine if you have a chronic pain patient that comes in, you have a device today that tells you everything from what type of stimulation parameters they're on, um, how frequently are they using the device, how compliant are they with the device, what body parts are they stimulating, um, what are the different functional outcomes that you can look at, steps, sleep, stress, um, all of these, what we find critical information about the objectivity of a therapy we're offering for patients, in addition to qualifying how they're doing beyond simply a VAS score, I think is incredibly critical. What's really nice about it is in the past, insurance companies didn't really think of value to reimbursing that, but that's exactly the opposite direction a lot of the big insurance companies are going, whether you look at Blue Cross Blue Shield, you look at a lot of the CMS guidelines, they're increasing reimbursements because the cost savings to a practice with earlier intervention makes a huge difference. The second part is we, in the kind of the theme with Nextim is we've become a virtual extension of those practices. So we've actually equipped ourselves with a large uh, volume of nursing staff that become monitoring patients that, you know, physicians can't necessarily do. So imagine tomorrow, you, the only way you would get med refills is you go back with your one month visit. Mm -hmm. What if you can make that a digital uh, feedback or you're able to intervene on behalf of the patient, then practices become way more efficient in seeing more newer patients as opposed to seeing the same cadence of follow-up. And I, I think most patients are extremely, I think, attuned to the idea that uh, more care, faster care, more immediate care is important to their kind of the psychology of how we're delivering the care model today. Mm -hmm. So how are they interacting in the model you're describing? Is is it, and you said like transcutaneous device, I don't actually know what that means. So maybe you can describe a little bit about like the next stem hardware, and then if there's like an app involved or how communication is happening from a, an information standpoint? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. If you look at um, today, TENS units is the equivalent analogy. Most people pick them up at a CVS and Walgreens. The challenge with most traditional field stimulation units are electromyographic stim units, which are basically muscle reconditioning. Um, the challenge with those majority of them is that the innovation cycle dropped when insurance companies stopped reimbursing high dollar value amounts and they became over the counter. The What we found out was around um, three to four years ago, we ran an interesting NIH funded clinical trial called FAST, which was in fibromyalgia patients that were over 200 plus patients and they randomized to placebo versus treatment. And what was fascinating about that is if you use certain biphasic frequencies on the skin, you are able to upregulate endogenous opiate levels. Essentially, you can make people upregulate their natural pain uh, killing mechanisms. But more importantly, most individuals in, in the clinical setting develop resistance to stimulation within 20 minutes. It's fascinating. So the body becomes very rapidly tolerant to a stimulation pattern if you keep bombarding it with the same thing. So what we did is, you know, the biggest challenge for the neuromodulation industry today or med tech industry today is the amount of, of money that gets spent on the front end on sales and clinical staff that end up spent um, occupying the care delivery model to a patient. You think about all of that goes into that process. How do you automate that? And we're in a generation where I think artificial intelligence is starting to become way more pervasive in the things that we hear all the time. 
So three to five years ago, we were thinking about this idea of crowdsourcing data across tens of thousands of patients to let AI run through a lot of the machine learning language models to better um, inform individual patients what treatment algorithms they are. So instead of running one therapy parameters, we're running where we could run almost 100 to 30 to 100 different programming parameters. So what then essentially does is for the patient, you're interfacing completely with the device on an iOS or Android platform via Bluetooth. So that's completely app driven therapy at this point. Got it. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. So tell me about, uh, you know, who, who all like, what does it look like to assemble a team? to accomplish what you're describing and how has that process gone for you? Yeah. You know, I, I, I tell you, this is one of the biggest challenges is uh, we had this conversation at the recent meeting about how important team development is. And, you know, you, it's been a, it, it's quite the um, being on the other side, when you're thinking about manufacturing inventory management to deployment of these therapies across the country constantly looking at the right fit for commercialization. Um, we have taken, you know, a few different steps on the iterations that we've assumed. And, and I think in the idea and the vision of a low cost concept, we've gone very heavy on digital approaches to sales instead of necessarily looking at the hard factor of having somebody physically there. Can we perfect sales through a, um, almost a digital ecosystem where salespeople are talking to physicians on a virtual format. I, I think it's it's an interesting experiment, I will say, as we continue to expand into the market because we're trying to pioneer this in the pain space. It hasn't um, it hasn't been done before. It's been you know traditionally any neuromodulation therapy has heavily relied on the interpersonal relationships to dictate how we do business. Um, but, you know, we're seeing some good cadence and we're continuing to roll this out. So, it, you know, we started um, by myself. We're almost about uh, 1,500 people indirectly affiliated or not affiliated with the business. So that includes manufacturing. And um, we are expanding to both India and Australia at this point to try and provide some access to these therapies. At some point, the long term vision is to build a low cost implantable. My goal is. Can I bring a spinal cord or a peripheral nerve stimulation device at the cost of you purchasing an iPhone? And that would be a radical change in, you know, do you need all of this insurance companies? Do you need all of this stuff to give patients access? Because if you're really thinking about the global market and pain being something so vital, then we need to be able to kind of think of a different model for accessibility and cost. Hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, sort of the information and the feedback from patients that your that this process is creating and what that's teaching you? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you we have a, a lot of these patient testimonials. It's an amazing concept. Um, so one of the things that I used to think was that you know technology sometimes in its complexity could potentially be a barrier for the elderly that we think are the majority that make our the baby boomer population that's now are getting older and they're constantly requiring uh, more interventions on the pain side of things. But what we're finding is that, you know, the technology is adaptable. And I, and I think people are even more adaptable in that they learn to uh, interface. So one of the comments that we've consistently gotten from patients is how they are impressed that a system allows better connectivity to their physicians. I think a lot of times, you know, patients don't voice as much about the the unfortunate reality of our current healthcare model, it is unbelievably difficult for you to get a primary care physician appointment today. Sometimes it takes up to eight months to see your PCP. We've filled that gap with urgent care centers all across the United States, but that's not an effective way to triage patients. I mean, I think we all recognize the cost to the health system. So when you're looking at a busy pain practice, if there's a way for you to integrate uh, a viable uh, additional ancillary revenue model, but enhance your ability to interface with the patients outside of your current ecosystem of users and people, I think Nextim is a really interesting way of changing that paradigm, right? Now you're treating somebody, you're learning something about patients, 
and you're giving them the added asset of an earlier intervention and connectedness that they may not have had in the past. So um, I think it's a really a good model. We're continuing to see those that are early adopters of it are getting the benefits of it both from a uh, clinical as well as a financial component. Yeah, that's kind of the, the holy grail in this department is finding the thing that makes the patient feel connected, enhances the right. decision-making power of the physician and gets you paid in the process. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say, look, a lot of companies are trying to do it. The problem is the 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 barrier for majority of these businesses, either one, they don't have the right device or the device is too expensive. You need a low cost solution because preventative medicine is really about um, looking at accessing th tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of patients. That's how it needs to work. So, yeah, weight machine and blood pressure cuff may be relevant in certain fields of medicine, it may not be in pain. I think we're in a really good position where we've kind of pioneered a device that's relevant to pain physicians making important decisions on the algorithm that they would go forward with after that point. What are, in addition to Nextim, what are some of the other yeah. uh, things you're working on right now? Yeah. So one of the other kind of key elements I've been thinking about is, you know, I, I think as we continued in the last, I would say, two to three years in the interventional pain space, we've seen an explosion of new therapies. Um, you know, we look at even how do we treat certain components of just back pain there in the olden days, you know, probably olden is a very, maybe an inappropriate word. I mean, in the last three to four years ago, you probably didn't have as many treatment options. And I think me and you were just talking about a similar personal experience for you, Justin, but I, I think the the challenge today for a lot of people is, you know, of the 6,000 plus pain clinicians in the United States that continues to grow, um, the field of interventional pain is secluded to maybe 25 to 30% of that demographic. And of those who are core experts in a lot of these different therapy modalities gets to be even less. So what happens is that there's a huge disparity for patients who, who don't have the knowledge of the awareness of things that are out there, however, end up seeing a certain physician that deems their entire downstream process of what they're going to get. So is it an epidural to a surgery to adjacent segment disease where they come back and we put in a stimulator or are they pharmacologically managed or is it that you do a lot of these minimally invasive spying techniques that are now starting to show more promise in terms of outcomes. So what I have really thought about is that I'm thinking through that process and part of the institute that we have formed and we're having our first patient facing conference is this idea that can we decentralize clinical care across large regions of the United States where you can pilot with different um, sub segments of practices that are doing a lot of good front end research, but really more from a patient education standpoint, having clinicians talk through their independent algorithm. I think the big challenge in education today on the physician side, we've done a really good job. We continue to train people on new therapies. We continue to give them access to these therapies, but the challenge is for patients to be advocates for themselves how do you do that if you don't have knowledge of what's out there? And so part of that is um, Coastal Research Institute is an independent organization. We uh, are currently servicing about 500,000 to about a million patients through our, through our network of different satellite sites. We are throwing the first patient-facing conference to really focus on patient education. And it goes beyond patient education. The nice thing about what we're doing is also trying to provide access to these therapies. Once you have that awareness, where do I go to get access to these therapies is a critical part of it. So again, we're trying to pioneer something that hasn't been done. I mean, I think we've seen the benefits of patient education in other fields, um, but I, I think there's a huge opportunity in the pain medicine space to really focus on that. So how, I'm curious, you know, obviously I'm pretty familiar with the conference circuit as you are, and as a physician who's, you know, doing the the medical conferences that has a certain vibe. I'm sure that a patient facing conference, like there's some similarity and there's probably things that are like a totally different approach is warranted. So can you talk about kind of how you've, how you're handling that? Yeah. You know, I, I think, look, uh, it is 
takes a, a immense amount of, um, I think, skill to distill medical jargon into something understandable without a lot of the, the words. But, you know, I, I, I think one of the, the beauties of this is that um, I think it forces our, a lot of our physician faculty speakers to talk more algorithmically, right? I think sometimes what happens is that we don't get enough in distilling what is the approach to somebody with back pain that's elderly? Do I always have to do an epidural versus going and having surgery? And I also think that it, it gives us an opportunity to be product independent. I think so often than not, we speak at a level of this company does X, I offer X based on the product this company does, as opposed to let me algorithmically talk to you about how should I manage your neck pain? How should I manage CRPS? What are the different therapy options? So one of the kind of new elements of this is we're trying to make it didactic with a little bit more on algorithm heavy approaches to different disease uh, processes. The second part is I think it, it the traditional way of marketing in going into these different boots, learning about a product is now the challenge for a lot of these sponsors is, well, how am I going to teach a patient about this? It's very easy to teach a physician about a technique, but what are the things that make my product valuable to the patient? And I and I think that's a really important um, flip in the thought process, right? So how do I position my things to look at a patient? What are how is this product different than maybe the other things that they can use for the same disease process? So I think it's going to be interesting. I, I mean, we're going to start small, and then hopefully it'll grow every year. Um, and the benefit of it is that it, because it's of the regionality of it, it's it's going to be better suited for being able to give access to patients based on, you know, the core faculty being actually able to do the therapies. And so you think that the people who are going to be coming are going to be people who are experiencing chronic pain, who are looking for treatment alternatives and looking to get more and more educated about what's out there and perhaps be able to understand better the limitations of their current uh, medical experience? hundred percent. You know, look, I, I can tell you, even within the practice, Justin, you're probably aware of this. Um, every group has like segments of folks that, that specialize in certain things. And you always have the two or three that are considered interventional. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that in, in, in for pain medicine, and I, I've said this, you know, I, we talked to a lot of different sponsors of different products and they go, oh, well, Dr. Shakravarti, why can't we get more adoption. Well, because the problem at the outset is that the outcomes that we collect, which is a pain score, is a very complex concept, but you're distilling it down to a score. So patients are starving for education. They're incredibly um, attuned to the fact that it's their body that they're putting them through. And you have all of these complex procedures now that are being done. Um, how do I educate somebody in 15 minutes? I mean, it's it's a very challenging or 30 minutes, whatever it is. And, and however that setup is, I think that we're we're shortage of time to explain a lot of these things. So I, I do think that um, patients are very much interested in getting more information. The online information that one can get is very product specific. It's not algorithm specific. And I think that's where something like this is going to be a very unique approach to education. Seems like there should be an E and M code for everybody who shows up. This should be a billable event, right? Yeah. For patient education. I'm not Absolutely. a billing expert, I mean, but it seems like it should be there somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that's a that's a good idea for sure. But um, you know, I, I I'll tell you, I I have so many of my patients are so excited. They're like, my God, I have never heard of anything like this. It sounds amazing. Um, but you know, I it, I think maybe this is a trend. We'll start to see more of this going across the country, but. I would love for that to happen um, as we kind of grow the our specialty out. Yeah, I mean, I'm. Yeah, my I'm thinking about myself. Fast forward thirty years, and I've got some like little knickknacky things right now that I'm sure as they uh, mature yeah. will be things that I'm going to need some more help with. And I think a format like this is very interesting. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Tell me more about. So, um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I just so the, the conference is on August 26th in San Diego. For anybody who's interested, um, you can learn on our website. Um, and, you know, we're giving the first 350 participants free registration. 
So we're encouraging all Southern California patients to come down there and really take a chance at hearing it out. I mean, I think hopefully we will have a ton of uh, involvement. It also gives us a chance to um, talk about some of our current clinical trials that they can enroll in and have some of the more cutting edge therapies that are in the market. So for listeners, coastalresearchinstitute.com, you can find more information about this. In addition, if you go to apmsuccess.com slash 207 for episode 207, I'll include links to Nextim, uh, this conference, and any other subsequent items that we discuss here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tell me about the decentralized trials thing that you mentioned, that component of Coastal Research Institute and the way that you're trying to uh, coordinate within, you know, with just, sounds like the, the pain yeah. physicians at other mm-hmm. entities uh, around the country. How's that? What does that mean? So it's, it's a really good concept. See, I, I, I think, look, you, you have one of the big challenges today in the pain space is in um, one is when you have a new study that goes through a randomized control trial, the reproducibility of that data in the real world is always a constant question, right? Great. You've got amazing RCT data, but that doesn't equate to how do I um, reproduce the same set of outcomes? So one solution, a lot of times is people say, well, let's just do registry studies. Let's do prospective studies that I recruit from Justin's practice. I may recruit from uh, Chris, Chris's practice, XYZ practices. The challenge, though, is that there are a lot of practices that may serve a certain demographic of patients. So, for example, if you're closer to the border, there's a higher Hispanic population of patients than if you were up in Northern California or in Texas, et cetera. So... One of the things that we are interested in is trying to adapt resources for different practices where they may themselves not have the financial resource to go out there and hire certain people, but within one kind of uh, uniform umbrella organization, we can help them recruit the patients then so that they can actually participate in that. So what happens with that is you're kind of decentralizing it from a standpoint of it doesn't always have to be one organization with set um, groups of people that um, deliver a certain outcome for a study. Now you're really getting into, hey, can we actually get a better slice of patients with more diversity? And I, I think there's a huge value to that. I mean, I think the National Institute of Health has always been trying to push this through their a lot of their HEAL initiatives. Um, but I, I think the advantage is that with a kind of a focus group in Southern California, we're better able to kind of uh, attune that and it's it's showing some good successes. So We've launched multiple clinical trials with a lot of different um, multi-site recruitment, which has sped up the speed of the trial. But more importantly, looking at uh, the diversity of patients in the trial has been substantially different than what it would be just as a single unit. Are there any types of trials or therapies or specific data that that this model is best suited to understand? Well, you know... You know, and I, I'll give you a good example. So the best part of something like this is going back to my original point, should the interventional pain space start to come to some consensus across different studies of what is the baseline litmus of data needing to be produced for adoption, right? Um, so is it good enough just for a vascular improvement or do you want to see vascular, promise scores, functional improvement? Um, so it creates a more unified data collection on a registry. Um, there is a company that's done very well, actually. It's called Viz AI, who have been incorporating a lot of the AI-based algorithms for rapid patient recruitment. So, you know, I think that there are tools that can be applied on the software side with a lot of these decentralized trials in terms of aiding recruitment. Um, we're just getting started in that. But I, I think the big question still today is, can you standardize outcomes across all studies in pain? And unless we get to that point where we can do that, uh, it's going to pose a challenge on how do you algorithmically approach some of this? Otherwise, just simply looking at it as, oh, I use this product versus another. So I think it's a it's in a good time in our specialty to try thinking that way. And I think this is a good breeding ground for something like that when you're trying to do it on a large scale. Um, one final sort of line of questioning I want to explore with you, something we were discussing before we hit record here. Um, thinking about opportunities for physicians to 
preserve autonomy and independence. And a big part of that is the financial implications of a career in medicine. And it's no secret, you know, every year, like clockwork, we see the CMS conversation slashing the physician RVU and, and per RVU reimbursement. Um, and more and more of the payment per procedure is getting pushed to the facility side, either the surgery center or the hospital. And as such, uh, it's, it's putting, a, it's frankly, it's getting like, we're seeing weird and wonky things out there. Frankly, I think what's happening is facilities are forced to pay out of the facility fee to recruit doctors because doctors are not able to be retained based on just the physician work RVU alone. But that aside for a moment, um, what you and I were reflecting on is giving physicians the, the understanding of the business of medicine and the economics of clinical practice and the opportunities for ancillary income in related therapies and just like how business in medicine works and the places in which physicians can participate in that, that can be a really important driver of the physician financial journey and all of the good things that a person enjoys whenever they are more financially secure. Uh, you don't have to be as financially motivated when you're more financially secure and you're more in the driver's seat of your own life. So yeah. I'm curious to just kind of hear you reflect on that and if there have been any either moments for you or resources or role models or how do you sort of think about this as it relates to how physicians should approach this? Yeah, you know, I, I think a really, really important question, Justin, because I, I, I do feel um, I actually commend you for doing this because a lot of folks, you know, knowledge is power. I, I, I agree with that. If you aren't aware of the ways that you can diversify your skill set, then it becomes really difficult. And, and I think inherently as physicians, this is one of maybe just an observation. We are very much trained to follow a protocol. You do med school, you go through residency, you go through fellowship, you work, and that's what you, you know, trained all the time for. To add elements of business almost seems uncharacteristic of a physician. Wow. I mean, what's the incentive? And you know, and sometimes it can also be looked or frowned upon by certain some of our colleagues. So I, I think what we have to realize, though, is, um, you know, time is an incredibly valuable resource. I think we have to pick and choose the things that we do. We have families, we have uh, things that we do. And, and I think knowing what your value is, because I think as we continue to see bigger health systems start gobbling up smaller practices or in the success or not success of that, you have to be aware of ways that you can protect your uh, time through more financial independence. And I, I actually think very strongly that resources like yourself, resources that are out there at these conferences about how to build a sustainable practice with different revenue streams, like whether it's in building an ASC, whether it's integrating RPM services, whether it's doing all of these different things that help you minimize the amount of time that your reimbursement is directly connected to an actual encounter is really, really important. But I, I think that it requires an in, in a form of, I guess, uh, motivation on, on the individual because it's so easy just to do the eight to five or eight to seven and, you know, not necessarily think that way. I, I do think it's incredibly important, but um, you need the right mentors to do it. I, I don't think it's easy to just kind of, because it's very easy to lose a lot of money. We've talked about this, you invest in one thing or the other, um, but to have the right people guide you in those investments to make sure that it's well, um, it's appropriately, like, you know what they say, fail a lot of times, but why needing to fail again if somebody's already gone through the process? You don't need to redo the rubric again. So I'm sure you get that all the time where people are naive to that fact and they don't think through that. So I think it's really, really important. The future isn't going to be a one-dimensional service-oriented industry. You have to be able to extrapolate it to many different things. Yeah. And for the younger physicians who are in partner, I mean, younger physicians who are approaching partnership or in partners partnership with you know, practices where there are older physicians who have been a partner there for 30 years. I, I tell people, and I was talking to a, a younger doc this morning, I don't think it's good to assume that you as a 32-year-old, you know, freshly boarded 
pain position. Like, I don't think you should assume you're going to do this for 34 years the way that the senior partners in your practice have, because I think the pressures are different. I think reimbursement is different. Consolidation is different. Um, just all the regulatory, you know, all the, the billion compliance and it, all the implications for your practice that you're dealing with. It's just, it's very different than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you should assume that a different path for you is going to be most appropriate rather than just put your head down, do the eight to five for 30 years. I, I don't think that's a viable option anymore. And I try to encourage people whenever no. I can, like assume that you're going to need to do something different if you want to succeed in today's environment. And a lot of it has to and, do with understanding these business and economic principles. Yeah. And, and I, I would also go a step further, you know, with the right uh, knowledge of that, you ask the right question about these different partnership tracks and models, yes. because yes. the things that worked in the past, like real estate and all these different components that get built into a lot of these partnerships, I think if you didn't have that knowledge or what the value of that is today, it's really hard to provide self-value when you're negotiating these things. So I, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's really, really important if you're starting out to get the right resources. It's so critical. Um, especially when you're in a non-academic environment where, you know, who knows what kind of things that you're dealt with. So I, I think it's really important to make sure that you're educating yourself and um, train, you know, making sure you're asking the right questions, especially. But I think your point's a really important one. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll end it on that note, Dr. Shakavarthi. Thank you very much for joining us today for another episode. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Always. I look forward to seeing you again, Justin. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com, where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.